podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Melissa, your Stephen King veteran. Hi, I'm Ben, the Stephen King and horror film fanboy. And hello, I'm Luke, your first time Stephen King reader. Luke said smile. I chose not to, but hello. Hi, welcome back, everybody. We are here tonight reading Duma Key. Uh, this book was published in 2008. My copy has 771 pages in it. I looked this afternoon. The dedication is for Barbara, Ann, and Jimmy. And I am, of course, joined, as always, with Ben and Luke. Howdy. Hello, gentlemen. Even. We are here. Here is what the back says. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I guess I should Appreciate read it that. to you. Okay, <laughs> put it up there. Here we go. Okay. On Duma Key, a man who should be dead finds healing in the solitude of painting, but Edgar Fremantle is far from alone. After a terrible construction site accident severed his right arm, scrambled his mind, and imploded his marriage, the wealthy, million, the wealthy Minnesota builder faces the ordeal of rehabilitation alone and enraged, renting a house on a stunningly beautiful and eerily undeve undeveloped splinter off the Florida coast, Edgar slowly emerges from his prison of pain to bond with Elizabeth Eastlake, a sick old woman whose roots are tangled deep in Duma Key. And as he heals, he paints, feverishly, compulsively, his exploding talent both a wonder and a weapon, for Edgar's creations are not just paintings, but portals for the ghosts of Elizabeth's past, and their power cannot be controlled. If you're new here, welcome. We kindly ask for you to subscribe. If you've been here before, thanks for coming back. Nice to see you again. All right. Well, we have thinkings, <laughs> um, and I'm going to start with Benji's first one, because yeah. it's the first one. Yeah, it, it, literally my note, it says first half, just first half of the book. Absolutely love this first half. I was actually enthralled, and this is telling for me because I'm usually the exact opposite. Like, I have to slog to get to the good, meaty, you know, scary bits and everything like that. And nope, I, I was in. Edgar Fremantle, Wireman. Uh, it just, it felt right. The character building for the first time ever in reading a King book, I cared more about that than the story. That was so much better in this book than the actual, ooh, what's going on kind of thing. I cared more about Edgar and Wyman than I did anything else. And that's saying something for yeah, a guy like me who really doesn't care about that kind of stuff. I, it's almost always a complaint of mine in almost every one of the books we read. And so this is the complete reversal. And so uh, the buildup you get of Edgar finding, you know, surviving this traumatic experience, dealing with the loss of his family, of his spouse at least, and everything because of that. And it's an understandable loss on both ends. It's, you know, why she left and why, you know, he acted the way he did. All of it's kind of forgiving and then him having to move on with it and you just see his build and his growth and yeah at times it's like okay where's this going where's this going but it never really felt like let's get to the next point it's always where's this going that and that, there's a big distinction for me in a lot of the books we've read like Lisey's story and a couple others this one's always like okay what's next uh, or you know where's this going instead of okay let's get to what's next kind of thing i cannot agree with you more on the character development of Edgar. I I think I felt the same thing. It's I want to know him as a person and is he okay? I, like if there was none of the other stuff, not the, it, and I am not talking about the other stuff because I actually enjoyed that stuff this time, but that's a different topic. Even if that hadn't happened, if this was simply the journey of a man coming back from the brink, I really enjoyed him growing as a person and that actually goes with one of my notes edgar is the first protagonist i feel like we've had in a very long time on this show 
who is who seems like a full human, right? It's he's not so broken like Jack was in The Shining, and he's not so perfect like Lewis was in Pet Cemetery, who had things happen to him. He's just a human with flaws, but also like some self control and some ability to like rein himself in when it's not the brain damage stuff, and and he's rational without being an over the top like alpha male but he's also not like weak i he's just like a normal decent human and he might be like i don't know about the book being my favorite i don't know but he might be one of my favorite characters we've ever met same. in a king book same and one other thing though cuz this is the second time now second book in a row where he's a normal character it just helps that he's a multimillionaire, you know, so he doesn't really have to be that normal human of, you know, financial struggles. So I think this is where, yeah, King's really in a stride of using himself, his own kind of stuff. The van accident, you know, facing a, a lot on that. But then also a van accident for a multimillionaire is not as hard. I mean, it's still emotional and it's still a struggle and physically hard. But, but you, you can pay your bills. But you can pay your bills and you kind of don't have to worry about the long term. I agree with you completely. The only thing is I like that Edgar built his fortune with his hands as opposed to like I and and no offense to writers or artists who make, but like he physically built that, right? Like that's that's the and we're gonna tie into Luke's note here. That is the Pull yourself up from the bootstraps with two broken down trucks and a, and, and a dream, right? I, I appreciate that because to me, that's more American dream millionaire than I, I tell good stories. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you guys are saying many thoughts that I had during this book, honestly, and I'm going through it twice. I have different feelings on different parts of the book at different times reading it almost, but the one mainstay, I think, is Edgar. I mean, really, a, a well-balanced protagonist that you're okay with rooting for and understanding where he comes from and seeing the struggles that he's going for, and you feel for him, but you can also see kind of what's going on. Like Benji said, like when, when his wife ends up leaving her, uh, you know, leaving him, she has pretty good reasons for that. So basically what happens, he has a worksite incident, he gets he's in his truck he gets run over by a 12-story crane pretty big deal uh ends up losing his arm busting up his hip really bad having some into internal brain damage uh and along with many other injuries that took a while to just become healthy physically to any extent and he kind of goes through a bit of a phineas gauge i don't know if you guys know that reference or not uh situation where the, the trauma to his brain physically changes how his brain is working. And it's almost like there are times where he is a completely different person. Phineas Gage is like one of those psychology case studies of he had an, uh, a railroad, you know, um, construction accident. He had a, a spike go through his head and was like an entirely different person. I mean, uh, it was like night and day, like his whole life fell apart because he just couldn't get along anymore. He was still alive and you know, successfully living, um, at least health wise, but uh, it totally changed all of the relationships. And that's kind of what it seems like is being hinted at here, just that how much something like this can change you. Luckily for Edgar, it's only a temporary thing and he's able to kind of work out of this, which I think is a common thing if you have a post-traumatic, uh, you know, type event like this. So, that's just one feeling that I got from it, and I love seeing his struggles on remembering just simple words, even like the chair. He can't think of the word chair. He he's like, sit on the fucking friend, go sit on the pal. Like he just and he knows it's wrong, but he just knows he can't do it, and like that's that's tough. But he also goes through these bouts of almost pretty intense violence. Uh, he ends up choking his wife at one point. And this is all like within a couple months of the accident. I think within six months is what it was that she couldn't do it anymore. Uh, yeah. I think he stabbed her in the arm with a plastic knife. Um, so, I mean, it's literally just a physically not safe environment for her either. Do I think she should have pulled the big D word out immediately? Maybe not. I think that's maybe a little quick. But 
it happened and it, it almost like that flipped the switch in him to go to the shrink to really start figuring out what he needed to do to kind of help himself get through this this trauma and i i, I love seeing the interior uh, of his head along the way because he is a good dude he's just a good diet good guy that had a, a bad accident right Agreed. And one thing going into their relationship wise, one thing King does really well is suddenly tell you that the marriage wasn't, you know, no marriage is perfect. No, but you know, but he gives you those little hints of the uh, not deception, the uh, disconfigurement, the disillusionment of it, even before the accident, like the little barbs she always jabs at him about, you know, whenever she gets the chance to, or him thinking about her father or the little things that she did that would annoy him. And so, I mean, and it's not like, you know, they would have divorced had this not happened, but it was on the path of they were just kind of, okay, we're here, we're comfortable, no need to rock the boat kind of thing, but there was nothing overly special about it kind of thing. Uh, so once she ended it, it took some time for him to grieve and move on, but he was able to relatively quickly, comparatively, because I think in the end, they both knew, okay, regardless is probably wouldn't have been forever and there was just little subtle things all throughout the book that kind of gave me that impression at least that um even once he's gotten better and yeah they had their one night fling after his showing and everything it never would have amounted to anything more than that again i don't know if i caught that I, i'm not disagreeing with you i just i didn't necessarily catch that it was bad prior it was probably just easy at See, and maybe that's it. Maybe it was easy, and as soon as it got hard, she yeah. noped right out of there, which, okay, I'm just going to say, you know me, and it is it is International Women's Day even today. I, I am almost always going to side with the girl, but I cannot side with Pam. I can't do it because... I get that it's hard and that, but that's not your husband. Like, and and maybe there was more that happened that we know about, but it doesn't seem like it. And like, give him a year, let him recover. And then if those things keep happening or he doesn't recover, then maybe at that point, but like, I, I just, you gave up. So I, started the book not respecting her and she didn't do much to earn anything more from me a little bit here and there helping out like putting together the the show and the traveling and trying to help in the emergency at the end contacting people who had bought the pictures okay but that was not redeeming enough for me she left a guy who needed help at i i i i, I can't i i have a hard time respecting Mm -hmm. I, I think so to meet in the middle here of what you both are saying I, I don't think you guys are disagreeing really um, I'm kind of agreeing on both ends uh, in terms of what Benji said I think there were maybe some subtle hints that it wasn't perfect but it just felt normal they weren't things that they were going to get divorced over it's just it wasn't perfect it was the everyday frustrations it was nothing like deserving of even like oh man i can't fucking stand being around her kind of thing or you know she's clearly giving me indications that she doesn't want to be in like i didn't get any of that it's more of hindsight okay well you could look at these but i don't know they seem somewhat soft they just proved that to me that it was a normal marriage after 25 years with two kids and a multi-million dollar company that they're running together like there's gonna be frustrations um uh, so again, I'm not really disagreeing. I just think that's how I put it in my head. Um, and yeah, I completely agree with you, Melissa. Pam, it just, come on, come on, dude. Like, give him a chance. Like, that's the guy that literally created this company with you by his side. And you're just going to bail on him? Like, because what, this is your retirement now? Like, you finally got to where you were comfortable and you can just decide that, like, was it always fake for her? That's I guess the question you ask, if she can drop it so easily six months later, like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's uh, she's not my favorite character by a long shot in this book. I wouldn't say she's the worst character we've ever seen. Yeah, but she's not. But a good, in a, 
Yeah. But in a book full of really good characters, yeah, it's she's... easy to notice her differences. Mm -hmm. And she is consistently yeah. one of the the troubling issues kind of in the internal relationships that happen. Yeah. And my other, like, to that thought, though, too, is where you said she was already ready to check out. You know, you notice within two months of the divorce or he moves away and everything, she's already getting a tattoo and, you know, kind of having – you know, having, yeah, a fling with two separate guys. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's fine. But she was ready to move on relatively quickly after coming to this hard, quote unquote, decision, you know. And it's, I think, like I said, going back to my point of, you know, it was there. She, it was easy for her. It was just kind of, yeah, cruise control. And then this happened. She's like, you know what? I'm out. You know, you gave me, you gave me my out here. I'm going to take it. And I don't, I'm not saying I agree with her. I completely agree with both of you guys. It's just, you know, that's the way it went down. So I guess kind of the way I did my notes today, I, it, this is, a, I would say, one of the more complicated books, if that makes sense. It doesn't seem like it when you first read it, but there's a lot of things going on. So I really just made more of a pinpoint of jogging my memory on things that happen in order. Uh, so after they get this divorce kind of thing, um, Edgar moves into a little lake house, and then basically through the advice of his shrink, Cayman, who was also awesome, uh, ends up moving down to a little uh, island off of the west coast of Florida called Duma, and it is the place that he goes to just get a change of scenery, and he restarts his old uh, fling with sketching and artistry in general. And yeah, I, I think it's a pretty good change of pace for him, right? And it's not just like the oh escapism; it's definitely more of a go to find himself in this new life. Is how I look at it. It seems overly successful. I I want to do that, and I haven't had an accident. Right. I, like I think that sounds that sounds like the perfect place to go rehab yourself and reinvent your life when everything is gone. Yeah. And like I was actually, you know, as I normally do, reading reviews and Reddit and Amazon stuff. And what <laughs> here's the thing for the people that are kind of gripping on the scenery and all this, uh, you might not have ever been down here. You know, I'm from the Florida Keys and everything like that. There is a slight magical power of just sitting there, listening to the ocean and the Gulf and everything just crash over and have no worries to, you know, stress you. And it is a, healing entity and i'm not saying it's just the florida keys but that nice serene solitude can do wonders in these kind of traumatic and just overbearing situations when you just can be alone with your thoughts yeah sometimes you need to be able to take a take a breath and be yourself and find yeah. yourself sometimes without the the hubbub of the everyday right Exactly. So uh, speaking of somebody who, oh, go ahead. No, I, I was going to move on to my next note, but go ahead. Okay. You. Speaking of someone, here you go. I'll, I'll, I'll just title in for all of us. Speaking yeah. of someone who left his first life and found himself on Duma, um, we meet quite possibly the best character in the book. And that's after we've said how wonderful the Edgar is. Wireman. Yeah. Yeah. Wireman. I want to be Wireman when I grow up. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, He's just, I, I get it, attempted suicide, spoilers, you know, he attempted suicide in his previous life. He lost his wife, uh, who had just, like, gotten, like, I don't believe they were married for a long time. I think it was, they were married, and then, hey, buddy, uh, they were married, and then, you know, she suddenly was killed, and he just didn't want to go on. He made his money and everything, but just didn't want to go on, so he made the choice of, if I pick an apple, I pull the trigger. If I don't, If I pick an orange, I move on. Closed his eyes, and the apple was picked. However, and I'm going to say this just as a firearms guy, he picked the absolute worst kind of firearm to choose to do what he did with because he picked a 22 long rifle, and those things don't, they cause a lot of damage, but they get stopped very easily. And if it gets up in the wrong spot, they're not going to do what you want them to do. Not promoting it, not encouraging it, just saying. It was just like, just that went to my brain. And yeah. And he ended up living with a bullet in his brain for it. Get, ended up getting a kind of a shine 
kind of like a shine esque. I don't want to call it the shine because I don't want to say it's because the shine is a natural thing. It's a born with. Uh, this is a grew or disco I would, wired. I would call it shine adjacent. There you go. There you go. Certainly in the same same yes. realm. Absolutely. Yes. And he gets a calling. He just spots an ad randomly to be the house servant uh, assistant to an elderly lady, and he's like, you know what? Let's go for it. Just why not? Up, why not? You know, packs up and moves on to Florida and meets the second love of his life. Maybe not in, you know, the natural way, but I, I would call her the second love of his life and everything. And he lives happily there, gets to chill on the beach, green, drinking green tea all day long. You know, all he has to do is care for and, uh, uh, oh, Alzheimer's, you know, early Alzheimer's patient and take care of her properties. Yeah, I want that life. I, I absolutely want that life. You can make friends with guys just hobbling down the beach, even though they might not make it for three three weeks, but just wave to them every day. They'll get here eventually. That was a great intro the, too. Just yeah, the me- meeting Wireman was awesome because it's it's a big part of this kind of you know um, Edgar finding himself and he's forcing himself to rehab his hip and walk as many steps as he can in a single day. It starts off with like 45 day one. And that's the whole loop that he walks out and back. Did you understand that's not really 45 though? It was like 45 if you count by nines. I don't know. The math teacher me was like, I'm not putting that much effort into understanding his weird nines counting, but I I, kind of understood it. Like it it was kind of a set of pushups. I I took it to like, it's a one, two, three, one, two, two, three, two, you know, like, Hmm. and that's kind of like, like a count up to here. And then you're counting that amount of it. Either way, it wasn't very far. And by like a month and a half, he was just working up to being a walk a quarter of a mile. And this place that Wireman was sitting at, I think they said was like two miles down the beach. And as he's working his way, walking a little bit further every single day, he starts seeing him a little closer and he gets like, I don't know, it was like 200 yards away and they kind of like wave and like shout hello at each other. And he's like, come on down. And he's like, not there yet. I, I don't know. I just loved the take your time and do it in your own pace. You know, do the day and let the day do you. And I, I thought that was just a really cool way that Wireman was just letting him do his thing. And... They were both totally cool with it, and then when they finally did get to hang out, I don't know. It was a, uh, it was a pretty good bromance, I, I'd say. Yeah. I I would probably say of the bromances we've seen from King so far in our reading, this is easily in my top two to three. Who else is competing with that? Bill and Richie. For it as a bromance, you know, just that one and. That'd be probably it. Those those probably my top two. And then may maybe uh the one from uh uh Insomnia. The old man and his uh friend who mm-hmm. just unsumer- unceremoniously was killed off. But that one wasn't as deep. This one was probably the deepest. Melissa seems like she has a oh sure. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a bunch of good bromances in this one. That's Definitely. true. True. Fair. I also don't have Green all mile the books to our down listeners. here yet. I don't have all the good books down here yet, so I feel like I might have missed a couple, and I apologize. But you can't not remember the bromance and spell. I, I specifically... I, I, I'm not saying it's as good, because at least Wireman and Edgar were built on a foundation of laughing themselves out of a chair, as opposed to let's survive the zombie apocalypse together. I mean, I get it, but like, I I think Clay and I want to say, oh, what was the kid? Jack? No. I was going to say Jack, but I love the Jack. Anyway, Tom, Tom, I, I think they would qualify in top 10 king romances that sure. hit. Maybe not as good as this one. Yeah. But I'm- Not my top three, but yeah. So... Yeah. But yeah, look, you, you were saying, uh, but yeah, the the introduction is a perfect example of just a good character, and you all automatically know I want to like this guy. And the funny thing is, it's in a section called Friends with Benefits. So the whole section of these two meeting, I'm thinking that's what they're kind of like, you know, Wireman's, you know, going to be helping Edgar along and all this. Then we get to the end of the chapter, and Edgar paints. 
and he finds out we find out what the friends with benefits is and we find out pam's been having her fun back up in minneapolis but again nothing wrong with that just the, the chapter title threw me because i thought it was all about the bromance and then nope Luke, do you want to keep going with your random thoughts on the sure. progression of the story? Yeah, so kind of next we just have a little bit of time hanging out on the key, and Edgar's paintings start getting, well, he starts going from sketches to colored pencils and then getting into painting, and it seems to be like it's one of those um, magical paintings that are painting themselves to an extent. Mm -hmm. um and with his missing right arm uh, whenever he goes into kind of these uber creative modes he you know almost like getting into the zone it he he describes it as if it's almost like it feels like he's painting with his phantom hand the his other hand um we yeah. learn more about what this is towards the very end of the book but he does a lot of research trying to figure out like what is going on mentally and like how there have been a lot of uh, stories, cases of other people who have either, you know, other amputees that have become spiritual detectives and like other kind of odd things that happen around them. So he feels like justified that he feels that way, at least. So that's good. Uh, he keeps it up and he starts being able to paint these things that he's never seen before. Like he finds out that his wife uh, is banging their old accountant and some new guy down in Arizona uh, because he paints it without ever knowing that that's happening. Uh, he finds out that his daughter is getting engaged at 19 years old because she, he draws the boyfriend at the time and realizes it's a big deal. It's just, he starts having like these premonition type things. Um, so that's where we first start getting some of our uh, magical instances and the ones that tend to do that are the ones that seems like he goes more into a trance kind of good getting into the zone of painting so that's that's kind of what is going on here in this section at least kind of yeah. the middle middle yeah. third ish we also have elsie his daughter that it, he, he points the boyfriend of or fiance of uh, she mm -hmm. comes down and they decide to explore the island they get past uh wireman and elizabeth's home maybe make it a few miles and then all of a sudden he edgar starts feeling not great but elsie gets sick as a dog and they have to turn around and come back and so it's like what caused that you know they immediately they say oh it's the tuna salad it's the warm climate this and that but you have you already have this feeling of okay there's something down that way that he, we might be finding out later you know <laughs> kind of thing and uh yeah, the phantom arm comes into play, but then also we start hearing the story of the mall uh, and the little girl at the mall, and I cannot remember her name or the uh, suspect's name, who he the takes her. The girl that was abducted. Yeah, yeah. He, they, the video of him taking her from behind the dumpster and such, and then he gets arrested, and Edgar goes into one of his trances, kind of goes to sleep, and everything wakes up, and wakes up the next morning, and that guy's dead and he this looks like the painting. One of those national news stories is is what's going on and because this is in a totally different part of no nope, it's in sarasota it's, it's okay it's it's yeah it's, it's a different area he's not involved i mean it's in right this. across the bridge yeah yeah right, it, right, it's right. right across the bridge so it's but it's one of those that will become a national story kind right. of thing and the the um, news that he ends up getting is it was a pretty gruesome murder of the mm -hmm. of the young girl so everyone's yeah. pretty pissed off at this guy this monster exactly and the the, or the lawyers already saying it's not his fault like he comes out it's not his fault he's a product of his environment he has mental issues and already trying to uh build a defense for the guy and that night again edgar goes into trance and he paints the guy without a fa without a mouth or a nose everything else in the picture is the exact same except for that wakes up why wireman calls him and, and so i believe it was wireman might have been mm -hmm. jack it was wireman uh, but yeah calls him and says oh good news yeah he's dead and Edgar's like, hmm? okay, and he goes up and looks at it because remember he painted the picture, but he didn't remember, you know, the weird thing. He goes up and sees, you know, what he had done. The guy ended up dying of congestive heart failure, but it's still sus suspicious. So you're like, okay, maybe they're just coincidence, maybe you know, not. But that's when he gets the idea to help his friend Wireman out. He gets the full story from Wireman of what happened to him 
everything, and he makes the decision to paint Wireman's uh, portrait. And during this the... time, Wireman had started losing his eyesight in one of his eyes, too, yes. which is a complication from the bullet in his head. Just It seems like it's finally gotten there. And that's kind of like the day before all this happens. So when Wireman calls him in the morning, and he says, oh, I've got good news. Edgar's like, oh, you got your eyesight back? Because he had started painting Wireman with the hopes of being able to figure this out, and then jumped over to the uh, the monster guy, the, the abductor, yeah. the murderer. But so he, he already has this thought that he can do this, right? That he can somehow affect things if he chooses to with whatever this magical power is. And it's it's interesting. Exactly. Like he gets a photo of the uh, x-ray of Wireman's brain and paints it without the bullet. Wireman wakes up the next day, or come, not even the next day. That was just later that day. Calls him and said, my head hasn't isn't hurting. And Hector's like, well, that's good. He's like, no, no, you don't understand. I woke up on the kitchen floor. My head has never stopped hurting. It might get less, but it's always hurting. Yeah, I can tell when it's not hurting, and it's not. And so that's you know kind of yeah the catalyst of uh, going into everything because he got the idea from basically killing the guy or suspectedly killing the guy. Took the next step to help his friend out with a bullet, and then they but like the wireman picture where he's trying to give his eyesight back that wasn't a trance one. Uh, because that one took weeks and weeks, but he tried and he like, you know, he had kept working and it finally did take effect once he was completely finished. And it still took some time after that. And he waited to finish that one until he could paint by himself on a like a tropical storm night. Like it was like the biggest storm that he saw while he was there, I'll say. Yeah. Um, and he like chose to almost do like a, I don't know, a captain at the helm of a ship, like, I'm going to ride this out and finish this in the storm kind of thing. And I don't know if that played a part in... In the dark, right. too. I don't know if that played a part in summoning more power to help his friend at all. I don't know. It just seemed like there was a some kind of island connection with the storm and the ability to help Wireman, which goes very, very successfully. Yeah, on, on that night, it was some right-hand painting done as well that was mentioned mm -hmm. as well. So. Yep. All right. So, so, Melissa, take it away. I, I really don't because, I mean, I am I feel like the next big thing is really the show. Yeah. Right? Like We, we start, so in between there, we start getting to know Elizabeth East Lake uh, and a little bit of her family's backstory. This is the woman who is the only remaining person of a family that owned the entire island 80 years ago. Uh, it was a father wife five six girls six girls i think six uh yeah. the wife dies the dad raises the daughters with the help of a, a servant uh in-house and their lives all kind of go crazy um several of them die a couple of them move away and kind of defect from the family and it, it's a complicated I'm not going to go into the details of all the sisters, but she's the only one still alive and the only one that stayed on the island. Um, and she owns the whole north half of the island, and her father really like actively complicated the handover of the southern part of the island in his three wills that he had, uh, just so that it would stay in the courts for years and years, so that it basically is one way to protect that paradise is seems... That's what Wireman anticipates that the reason for that being set up the way it was uh, is. And so she's she's this 83-year-old woman. She's the woman, 85-year-old woman that Wireman is taking care of. She's on her way getting deeper into Alzheimer's and uh, definitely has very lucid moments and definitely has some uh, more troubled moments that almost seem to coincide a bit while Edgar's there with these phantom arm painting nights to some extent. I wouldn't say it's a end all be all true connection, but I noticed it was like there was a couple nights where Edgar was up painting into the night, going through one of his trances, and he heard from Wireman the next day that she had a really, really bad night. I think that happened at least twice. Uh, so it just felt like there may have been a connection there. But we, she's awesome. She's super sweet. She is uh, a huge lover of the arts. and um, Very smart, too. Very, very yeah. smart. I, I thought she was one of the one of the better characters as well. Uh, that's kind of what that next section is, is learning more about 
her background mm -hmm. in spurts. And, and like, and the um, art critic who knew her and like all yeah. the stories we get about her as an adult. And Edgar's like, I wish I knew her mm -hmm. because by that point she had really fallen into pretty much total Alzheimer's right he wasn't able to really talk yeah. to her so he talked to others about her exactly he only got maybe maybe three conversations maybe four that we saw at least because he did used to sit and read her poetry so who say they didn't talk but we got maybe three or four actual conversations with with her fully lucid or relatively lucid and the phone call uh, it, well, that's one of the ones i'm considering i'm counting okay. uh I'm not counting the the voicemail. The, the voicemail one was a whole different thing, but then the phone call uh, was a full conversation. But yeah, she was very well respected, very well liked. Nobody really messed with her or her properties, you know, kind of thing. It was you do not mess with Mrs. Eastlake. Uh, and yeah, as like you were saying, we get kind of her backstory, which is when she was three years old, falls off a horse, bangs her head. Huh, another, you know, physical ailment, injury kind of thing happens to be here on Duma. She then all of a sudden becomes a prodigy art, you know, yeah, a prodigy art, savant, artist. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, savant. Savant was the word I was looking for. And she's starting to paint these excellent things. And then all of a sudden things start to happen. And she gets a little dull and it's kind of guiding her. But we don't learn any most of this until the very end. And so to jump to it just to kind of ease stuff in you know she's getting kind of guidance from a doll of hers of how to do certain things to help her family out and make things better but as we all know the monkey's paw typically works the other way around and just progresses overtly to the worst timeline kind of thing can i family. talk about the doll really quick <laughs> sure Go i'm it. jumping it sure freaks me out when we found no bean <laughs> who ended up being not a bad doll. Like, yeah. I thought no being like early on when she starts talking to Elizabeth, you're like, oh, great, talking doll. That's not going to go well. <laughs> and then by the end, like, no being's the one that fills in all the blanks. Okay, maybe no being is not, not such a bad, creepy talking doll. Right. So, yeah, we'll, let's get to the show really quick, if you don't mm -hmm. mind. Yeah, um, yeah that's I think so where I'm at. Okay, so we, we get to, he, he first starts showing off his paintings. He shows them to Jack first, I believe. Well, mm -hmm. he shows uh, El Elsie his drawings. Then I think Jack Ilsa, saw a couple. isn't it? Ilsa, I, 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 it might be Elsa. I'm, I'm misremembering the name. They were, Issa, they were sometimes he used a nickname calling it Ilsie. Okay. Okay, and yeah. Sorry, I, I actually read this one and didn't do the audio book, so. Gotcha. Yeah, there were yeah. a lot of nicknames. So. Yeah, no, that, I did have an issue with that. It was very <laughs> annoying. Uh, but, uh, like, so. He starts showing off his photos, and Jack tells him that, oh, yeah, my mom's friends with the this art gallery or used to work at this art gallery. You can go and show them your stuff, and he does, and everybody loves it. Everybody that sees his paintings loves it, you know. Nothing that anybody should, and so he gets an art show, brings in all the people, you know, all of his old friends. Pam helps out, as we mentioned, helps Wireman get, because Edgar's being very, not sketchy, but very flaky in committing to this, so they basically force his hand and make him show and everybody loves it. He sells out in one day, but then Elizabeth shows up. And Luke, you want to go from there? At the art show? Yeah, at the art show. Yeah, sorry. I was making a comment in the chat about uh, <laughs> Edgar's rage doll. Uh, yeah. Rita? No, Rita. no, Reba. 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 Fancy. And yeah. then, oh, was Fancy. Here's fancy your one dead. chance, Fancy. Don't let me down. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I thought the rage doll was cool. I just wanted to put that. There was a couple of comments about not trusting dolls, and I, I thought it was worth uh, mentioning. The I, rage I would doll. say that's a good. That's a that's a good life motto in general. Have a rage doll. Don't trust rage don't trust, dolls. Don't trust dolls. Uh, yeah. So Elizabeth shows up at the very end of the showing after all of the prints had been sold. All of the painting sketches have have the red tag right, on yeah. it that they're that they're spoken for and like that is just unheard of right and this is kind of like she was in for a surgery this afternoon uh, because she was having some complications that jack uh which is edgar's little kind of helper that he hired to get him settled and help him out um but jack and wireman took her 
Elizabeth to the hospital for the surgery, and then she shows up late in the show as like a really big surprise. And she's looking around, walking with Edgar, and stops at a couple of the ones that Edgar always knew were more troubling. They always, they were certainly all more in the trance phantom arm painting realm, and he could realize there was a certain theme going on with them, but he didn't know what it was. When she sees them, she kind of loses her shit. Um, well, not quite. She was actually cool with it until she saw the number very, eight. The very last one, right? Yeah. yeah. Because he it wasn't for sale. Right. No, you're right. That, yeah. That's what pissed her off. That's what kind of freaked her out because she saw the faces. She's like, don't you see the faces? You saw you painted my sister. One of the he can oh, he could identify almost every girl because the series that, that you're talking about is Girl in the Ship series, mm-hmm. and uh, he could identify most of them were always Elsie or whatever her name is. Uh, there was one one or two that he thought maybe one was Elizabeth or something, and then there was one that he couldn't identify. And she's like, "And you painted my sister. That's that's my sister. Whatever her name was, one of the uh, Adriana, isn't it? Yeah, Adri, Adri. and." That's yeah, that's exactly who it was. And so he's like, What? And he's like, Yeah, yeah, I, I know that ship, that's Percy. And she's like, Wait, why is this one not for sale? And then it kind of sends her into a medical because she doesn't want it coming back to Duma. Exactly. She she knows it has to go. She knows the power. Yeah, she made a comment to him early on. Whatever you do, don't leave too many paintings that you make here on the island. And so she sees this one, which yeah, she obviously is already kind of upset about and realizes the power that's in it. And yeah, I mean, recognizes, I, th- I thought it was both of her little sister, her two, uh, her two twin sisters that drowned. I thought, cause she said, don't you see the faces in the water? And that's yes. That's right. who they're. Yeah. She was talking about the face, those two in the water. Right. And yeah. So were there she, more than two faces though? Cause there could have just been lots of faces in the water. I, so I don't, I'd have to go back and listen to it again. Um, I, I know it definitely said faces, and I think so. There was one girl on the shore, right? Is what it, it was, and or on it's the boat. in a lifeboat, in a lifeboat, or so that in a was, rowboat. That was Adri, and yes. the two other. I thought it was just the two faces because at that point, what we learned towards the very end, it was the two little girls that she was trying to go save with her husband, and so there were two faces in the water that. Work. But at that point, the husband was dead too. Right. So there could have been three potentially. I, I it just didn't. I don't think it's specified. Uh, but the way it's described is like only if it was pointed out to you would you notice it. And it certainly doesn't look intentional to Edgar. Even he's like, you're only seeing this because well, because Ilse she she ends up seeing it after Elizabeth gets taken away in the ambulance, mm-hmm. and Edgar's basically saying, well, you'd only think that because she put the idea in your head you know she put that seed in there it's certainly wasn't intentional at all um so yeah she ends up going to the hospital elizabeth and dying the next morning and so we lose we lose her pretty sad moment i know wireman takes it pretty hard i mean that's like benji said someone that he you know loves dearly close to his heart taking care of her for i think it was like 18 months but they had gotten pretty close being the only two on the island other than people that are there for a month or two out of the year. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a tough moment. And it was one of those things that Edgar was really surprised about. You know, it's he gets a little more information from her as she's kind of freaking out <laughs> before yeah. she goes to the hospital. And it kind of starts making him rethink a few things a bit. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to get to this point here because I both times I audiobooked this and I listened to it fully every time or you know two two weeks in a row because it took this, this one took me a while because it's a long book. This is the main reason why I say not every book needs to be as long as you can make it. Every part of this first half, I loved it, and to Melissa's point, had it stopped right here, I would have been fine. I loved this book up until this point. Then we flipped the switch. Pretty much that night, or the next morning, we flip the switch when they start talking about it, get the picnic basket and all that, start going into the magical realm and, like, the diving deep, and I just checked out. 
and it might have just been over just having to li- you know listening to it for hours on end kind of thing to get through it and by this point i'm just like i heard the good story edgar you know he saved the you know daycare center by selling all of his paintings kind of thing at least in my head that's you know how it can go and they can right off in the sunset be all happy and so from here on out i i've li- I listened to it and i know of it and it just doesn't hold me as much as the part up to this point you know so i oddly completely agree with you (laughs) i not i mean it's it's odd because i i was curious the first time going through this i did this all almost in one day because i had a long travel day down to texas i had to fly and drive and then drive and then fly so i had like all day pretty much and and it was so i got most of this done in one day and i get to here and i'm like okay that's that feels like a good wrap-up point like I, maybe a couple little things that get solved here another chapter i look there's eight hours left it's two-thirds of the book and i'm like yeah. okay i what? mean I'm, I'm still interested but why like i feel like we're at a good spot like it really does seem like it changes from that point on to an extent right it's when all of the other things kind of come out of the woodwork and we'll talk about final thoughts when we get there but i can this is a pivotal point in the story i think Mm -hmm. uh for sure in the way it's written and what's going on yeah okay so i just want to tell you like i think it's really interesting that you guys feel like that because i physically read the book now not the book i got it from the library and i read it on here and and I also was listening to the audiobook on my drives. And I love John Slattery, but I had a hard time getting past the 1960s when I was listening to him. And so that was just, you know, Mad Men, Howard Stark. It was a whole thing. So Is that who that is? Yes. The, the Silver Fox dude from yes. Mad Men. Holy shit. Okay. Sorry. Yes. I, 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 I know Benji yeah. likes it. Now he likes it better. No, no, no. <laughs> I mean, I'm, the, so. the, the, as, as soon as you said it, I'm like, I knew exactly who you were talking about. Once you said Mad Men, I'm like, the voice, yeah, it hit yeah. perfectly. Yeah. Great. Okay. Great. Okay. So. I'm listening to the book going, I just want to get to the good stuff because I see dead people. (laughs) I was so excited to have dead people again. It's been so long since we've had real life dead people. It's not like, oh, my husband died from a something, something, and I'm going to kill the one bad guy who's chasing me through my magic pond land. No, actual Lots of dead people. Cayman, dead. Tom, dead. All the sisters, dead. Babysitter, like, girl, Didn't dead. Didn't Bozy die, too? Dead. I was sold. I was like, let's go. <laughs> Who else are we taking out? Wyerman, three months later, dead. But, yeah. like, you know, don't get me wrong. I, most of those people I really, really, really liked, and it was really sad for me when they died. Here we go. There's Stephen King. We're knocking people off left and right. We sucked you in. We got you good. And you get a dead body. And you get a dead body. And you get a dead body in a well. And and, and you get a dead body who's not really dead. So, yeah. And I'm reading this. I'm about halfway through all the scary stuff. And my son is like, what are you reading? And I was like, oh, it's, it's, a, it's you know, a scary book. Because this has actually got some scary components compared to, like, I don't know reading the story which it's not yeah. as scary to me as or sell and he's like oh is it another clown book because mm-hmm. hi, we read it for two years and i was like no 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 this one there's a bad sea witch who makes people do nasty mean art things <laughs> it was like okay <laughs> and, <book. laughs> and that's actually a great point most because that does tie into my third note i do have a couple criticisms i want to i don't want to forget about but the lack of the backstory of the bad sea witch is like what the okay i don't need full exposition i can you i can use my imagination a bit but give me something it's just bad sea witch paint this dead why i i i need a why like what caused like a random half page of like maybe a ship from some kingdom of long ago wrecked and lost their god statue okay i missed that point i mean i agree with you it wasn't like the best backstory ever yeah so so it's funny like i'm not saying this saves it at all but like all of the imagery built around percy 
right? P E R S E is really describing Persephone quite yes. a bit. Queen of the Underworld. It seems like they could have leaned into that a little bit more and you get like infinite backstory just alluded to. Hey. <laughs> She's the queen Maybe, of the damned. Okay. They did and mention Persephone once or they did mention Persephone once or twice. But I, then blew that was it the, off. That was the but name the, on the ship itself. Yes. No, but, they mentioned the Greek mythology and then we're like but that's not really it it's probably this other weird god thing right yeah yeah and, and it's so yeah that kind of irked me but most to your point of the, of the dead vice i appreciate that the fucking spoilers in this book from king himself pissed me off oh, so you much knew the daughter was gonna die like on the second page or something crazy well, no like, like it, it was like like half a chapter it was like maybe only a few chat pages before but he's like and that's the last time i spoke to her and you know we said her at least i said my loves you it's like okay and oh, that's the last man, time i knew she was gonna die well, like way back at the very beginning i did too but i it's still don't get it's it's still don't spo- don't be that obvious about it. It's be make a little shock moment of it because the problem too is we get only his perspective, and so we don't get that that third person omni- omniscient whatever, uh, right? Per- 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 you know perspective. So like when he's down in the well dealing with Novine or whatever the damn doll uh, name was, mm-hmm. uh, getting in the light thing, and we have a battle or an almost battle right above him. We don't get any of it, and it's like you just hear about it a little bit. You just hear a little bit about it, and I mean, and and I get it from a per- first person perspective, but it's like we don't get that. We don't get you know uh, Elsie and Mary, you know that kind of thing. We just get, well, this is what happened because I, I I see it in my mind's eye. It's like, oh, shut up, you know. Okay, get, but but if you're gonna write a first person novel, having a first person narrator who has this omniscient. <laughs> ability is pretty convenient for it, some it, of that right it is, like, it, it is but it just felt lazy on on that aspect but again overall good story but those little things were just like it just or every time because there was a few times and even like at the very beginning of the book he said i'm already on my third life down here in mexico mm-hmm. so you already know he made it out to mexico by like the third page that one's like the third mm-hmm. page he already made it to mexico and it's like okay <laughs> you know well, and then you get about I don't know, seven eighths of the way through, and you hear Wireman went to Mexico, and you're like, oh, maybe they like Andy Dufresne did. Same much like, Up at the end, right? <laughs> nope. No, nope, yeah. Nope. So I'm going to quickly blitz through some plot points that we yes. have jumped a little bit over, but I think are important. So quickly, after the art show, Elizabeth dies. Edgar, I forget exactly how he realizes this, realizes that all of his paintings that are these special paintings that sold are going to kill the people that bought them um, to some extent. Um, It's a whole thing. I don't want to get into the details on who did what. Um, His ex-wife almost gets killed by the accountant guy that was banging her at one point. Um, His daughter... He drives into a wall. Yeah, he ends up killing himself. In a moment of clarity, yeah. Um, His daughter, Ilse, does get killed after Edgar was able to thwart the initial attempt at the sketch that she had in her apartment from killing her. Um, She eventually does get killed overnight after that whole thing because of somebody else that he had a painting to that they, he forgot about calling and uh, came and had a heart attack, came and had a heart attack. Um, So he was able to stop most of the paintings from going out since most people had to fly down to him. They were having them framed and shipped uh, from the gallery so he's doing this like scavenger hunt like who took what who who do i need to prevent from getting their painting um and just basically throw this five hundred thousand dollars million dollar thing away basically because they're gonna kill people um which is so, the one point really quick luke yeah just uh because this this one part right here made me think was elizabeth really good because she's the one that specifically said get them off the island and she was happy that they were being sold she should have known of the power yeah that i don't that know but i was curious maybe she that. was like like kind of a marionette kind of not saying that it was all her but maybe being marionetted of or was it them. because she died then for some reason the paintings became if the power helps. broke like right, the, that's whatever protection i don't know i could be what one or the other but like i remember thinking that i'm like it just seemed a little, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, I took it as she just didn't like. She knew there was something with them, but maybe 
didn't realize in that, that they whole, went somewhere else. You know, how much yeah. can you remember when you were four, like, amnesia piece of some of that? Mm-hmm. I, that's what I assume. Like, she knew it was bad, but maybe not all the details of why. So. Right. Fair. So he goes through this whole thing, ends up saving a couple people, can't save everyone. Um, bangs his ex-wife for one night. Um, they end up Jack, Wireman, and Edgar, I think we're basically at that point where they just decide, all right, we have a pretty good idea of what this Percy thing is. I don't know, I don't remember exactly how Edgar figures all of this out just through visions and putting the piece of information that he got from Elizabeth, I think, connected some other dots that he found out. Go ahead. He read her paintings in the red That's basket. That's what it was. Yeah. Yeah. He went into her attic and looked at all of the things that she had done, and that kind of filled in a lot of the blanks. Because half a book earlier, he said, if I had listened to her earlier and gone and gotten the red basket, we would have been able to avoid a bunch of this. But instead, Jack's the one who found it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so and those and then like 400 paintings. pages go on, and then we realize yeah. why. So those were her magical paintings when she was two, three, four, whatever. Uh, and he finally gets his eyes on them, and it connects all the rest of the dots, and he realizes what they need to do. And Wireman and Jack are just like, Dude, we got you. We're going. We're on your team. You're not leaving us behind. It's kind of like a Harry, Hermione, and Ron moment. Like, no, no, no. You don't do this by yourself. You have a saving people thing. Like, no, we're going with you. And uh, <laughs> they, they they do it, and they kind of go through. Of what, course you're going alone. Oh, what, and I'm going and with I'm you. Going okay, with Sam Wise. You. Right. <laughs> and they kind of go through a bit of an obstacle horror course uh, to get to the southern end of the um, – of the island where there's one kind of broken down house building thing. Uh, it very much in this portion feels kind of Pennywise esque that their specific fears are coming out in invading their brains to some extent. Um, sure. As they are trying, it seems like the island or Percy, whatever this thing is, is trying to prevent them from getting to the cabin that's broken down uh, so that it can stay protected. So, they finally get there. They work through it. Uh, they go into the basement, and there's a cistern that has some water in it, and that's where we find this little totem, this little china doll, dressed in a red robe. That is the red woman that Edgar's been seeing in some of his dreams and not really knowing who she is, but that yeah. ends up being Percy, right? Yes, but before, but right before that, they get into the house, and they find the Noveen doll. Right. Yeah. And, Melissa, you have a point to this that i completely agree with i just i I, like this was the one piece that really bothered me in this book there wasn't much but the the 11th hour like and and i'm probably not even using the term but it felt like one of those do do ex machina things where it's like thank you where it's like oh no i need somebody to come save me um teenager in the room by the way i happen to be a ventriloquist yeah. I have a particular set of skills that make me a nightmare for a story like this. I can find I can I can find you at, or I can get your Wi-Fi hooked up. I can find you any furniture and I can speak to it. I have a doll speak to you. It's funny. <laughs> Resume. I mean, that's the thing is I like the kid. I just was yeah. like, oh, really? <laughs> that that felt contrived. <laughs> that felt very contrived. And mm-hmm. at, at, at the end of it, he just Kind of gets it started. It seems yeah. like it ends up channeling through him exactly. in the long run. But and I agree, so, it's a bit like you just happen to be a hobbyist ventriloquist, really. <laughs> like when that's like the one thing we need. Who was it? Wasn't there a magician kid in uh Salem's Lot? Wasn't there a kid that did magic tricks or something? So, yeah. And yeah. you know, kind of similar thing. Uh, but yeah, so we get the we get the full uh I need a ventriloquist. Sorry. <laughs> if only I could talk to this doll. Well, you know. We have a medical emergency. Is anyone a ventriloquist? <laughs> How often does that come in use like this? I mean, come on. Yeah. Well, I mean, at least he had the poor size. Like, I won the, you know, grade school talent show and everything. But by the time we got to middle school, it didn't seem cool anymore. And so mm-hmm. it's like, and that's fair. I mean, you, I can, I did magic in fourth grade, never did it again. 
I, you know, so I can understand you pick up something it's like, yeah, hey, that's cool for a talent show, but then just but when on. will you ever be in a life or death situation where hey, you never know when you get a quarter stuck in your ear? Out of your sleeve is going to save a life. I was like, going to say, you never know when you might have a quarter stuck in your ear. Can someone get this quarter <laughs> out of this man's ear? Well, I've got you. <laughs> bing, bing, bing. Hold on. Here's five more. This is my <laughs> but, moment. I've been waiting for decades. <laughs> but so we get the full Elizabeth Westlake, uh, Eastlake, sorry, Westlake, Eastlake story through no being through Jack and everything. And it's a weird way of doing it. She's like, oh, and draw me here and put me here. And again, at this point, I'm already kind of half checked out. I'm like, okay, just get to keep it moving. We're getting the backstory here. And one really it was an interesting question. Is no way being of doing the. Helper, the uh, yes, it's yeah, John. no, bean was the, actual no, 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 her actual her doll. doll, okay, is the doll, um, Miss uh, Nan, Nan was the uh, assistant, I right. believe. Sorry, uh, there no, was no, a lot right. going on at this point, Nan Melda, yeah. Nan Melda, yeah, I, I had a like, yeah, keeping up with names and such, it was uh, that's why I a lot of space because it was all uh, like we said, code names and nicknames, so it was Lizbeth and Aidy and Nan and. And you're like, okay, who the hell are you talking? I mean, you're like throwing out Honestly, six different names. That's that... why I read it. It was easier for me to uh, visually yeah. see it to be able to. I can completely understand that. Mm -hmm. uh, but we get the full backstory, and that's when we learned about the Ruby thing, where Percy being in the cistern, being locked down there with Adri and the twins, uh, because that's where John and ended up... Nan Melda and Nan Melda, yeah. Well, the and twins that, are not down there. It's Nan, Melda, and Adri are locked down there. Okay, okay, gotcha. Because the, the, the twins' were bodies water. were water They're, bound. Gotcha, with, that's right. Uh, Adri's husband. Yep. Yeah. I think it's really interesting that nobody knew those two were dead. They just thought that they disappeared. Never reported. Yeah. Just moved on. Well, like, because the, they were, they had moved away and come back just to help and everything like that. And so they probably, everybody just thought, oh, they moved back to wherever. Did, can we point out nobody ever pointed out that Nan was missing too? Yeah, that's. But again, if it was a yeah. situation like Wireman, if Wireman died and Edgar didn't know him, would anybody be there to report it? You know, it, it might be a situation like that. You know, which could Classic be the reason. Falling I mean, in the woods. Yeah, exactly. No, but John was there. The dad. But John's, John's the one Eastlake that killed her. There. John's the one that killed her. I know, but he didn't. And then not like, under his you own. You could spread the story that because he killed his daughter yeah i'm saying you could spread the story that the other two left what story what excuse do you have that the livid housekeeper lady is gone okay he just again, didn't. She, she left you know maybe she left and since again no friends no family in the area possibly and they did. moved so yeah. to clarify some of this john was being possessed by yes the doll right by percy, by percy. the yeah. china doll i mean yes um, and we end up seeing some other possession things going on as well that resurrected possessions, if you will. Um, that's when they actually finally get down, when Edgar gets down into the cistern and he climbs down the ladder one-armed uh, and falls the last set onto a big old pile of them bones. Uh, that That's when we start hearing a bit of a commotion up above that the twins and Adri's husband were reanimated corpsing their way mm. to go fight Jack and Wireman, right? And right. this, it, it's one of those like last minute hurrahs, like Edgar's down in the water struggling to open up the, they didn't have a watertight container. The whole thing that was figured out to uh, contain uh, Percy was to put her in fresh water. Like Melissa said, it's a sea witch. Apparently the salt water is key. So the fresh water was like a prison and they needed to put her into fresh water. The container that Elizabeth had originally put her in was leaking, which is why she's been somewhat gaining more power Active. lately. Yeah. Um, and it was like just one of those perfectly timed before the, the guys up above were about to get in real trouble. Edgar gets her in the water inside of a flashlight. That was like the only thing they had. Yeah. It's like just good enough. <laughs> it, like Jack, no, like they're like, we need a water tech container. And Jack's like, oh, we're good. Doesn't expect it's the Hermione Granger thing. You could take three seconds to say, you know, instead of before Jack gets down there or before Edgar gets down there, we're like, oh, just use a flashlight. How about you go down with that mentality <laughs> kind of thing? 
So but, they saved the day. Yeah. And for for those watching, if you were, uh, the joke I was making it was basically this all has to happen before sunset because right as sunset goes, the doll comes to life and tries to chew through because uh, Edgar's holding her, I believe, in the stump of his arm. Oh, no, he's holding the flashlight. He's got her under the left armpit. And she tries to chew through his chest to get to his heart just because right as sunset she comes alive. And that's when the horde starts attacking and everything. The horde, the three of them start rushing. A three person everything. horde. <laughs> three person horde. Well, versus a two man defense, you know, yeah. they've got good odds. Yeah, true. <laughs> but it was just, and then yeah, he just gets her in there and seals it and done. And then he hears him scampering away. Mm -hmm. they just like go back into the water (laughs) yeah yeah Yeah. it's a lot a lot of moving parts for sure there was and another pennywise reference uh probably caught it i can give you life. i can give you can live forever Mm -hmm. i can give you long life and at all the wealth and all that like very very pennywise aspects uh in that instance of the creature trying to just survive definitely i got a very there were plenty (laughs) of similarities Mm -hmm. i'd say um so they they leave they kind of do some other things um edgar ends up making a version of his daughter in the sand to yes. that who who died to like talk to her one last time and he almost it almost seemed like the the totem in the flashlight was trying to talk to him as like hey i can resurrect her if you let me out, like like the last hurrah. And he right? had made the sand drawing before, before they, they went to go do the yeah. thing. Right. It was actually right after he found after he hung up the phone. Like he just walked out and did the drawing. Mm-hmm. You know, Painted in, the her in the sand, basically. Yeah. And he ends up not doing that and choosing to let his daughter go, basically, and makes the hard choice. Um, they kind of live their lives a little bit and he moves back up to minnesota for a little bit um we find out that wireman goes down to mexico and he's interested in buying a little hotel a rundown hotel wireman was the sole heir to all of elizabeth's fortune uh which mm-hmm. was like 120 million or something 60 160 million not a bad uh not a bad payoff yeah. there at all for 18 months and edgar decides that he needs to make one final painting and what yes. he does is he he draws up an incredibly densely packed <laughs> hyperstorm that basically pulls duma key under so a couple things with that wireman cuz he only he gets the property and the cash so but to get the rest of the cash yeah, like you said he sells the property off to elizabeth's family knowing full well what edgar has in store right. so he sells it off not even at a discount actually at a premium price for so he gets premium, full do- uh, real estate yeah, gets full dollar for it and with that money he makes a sil- sil- cylindrical container made of silver or he has fa- uh, fashioned filled with fresh water that the flashlight goes in the flashlight is filled with fresh water that has the china doll in it and they drop it in the middle of the lake right next to edgar's house just happens to have 322 feet at this one particular spot. It's like a, a, the a fissure in the, the, in the fissure. bottom of it. <laughs> the rest of the lake's 20 feet deep, but this one little fissure goes down to 322. So, so I'm going to tell you guys, you've you've just touched on one of the questions that I had planned, oh. which is totally fine because I can skip it. I have extra. <laughs> but for the question, I also Googled how far is St. Paul, Minnesota from the closest ocean, and it's more than 1,700 miles. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So not only is she in a flashlight filled with with fresh water in a silver sealed cylinder in also filled with fresh water. Lake, mm-hmm. In a landlocked lake. In a landlocked 400 feet underneath at the bottom of a landlocked lake. It is a landlocked lake that is 1,700 miles from the nearest like saltwater ocean. Mm-hmm. And they're like, we realize it's not a perfect system, but it should do okay for a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just I like, just imagine James Cameron down there in his little uh, <laughs> submarine. <laughs> Ooh, what's this? So Wait. my thought with this, like, and this was the point of the question. I'm just going to move on and not use that one. So do you think, like, this is the first time I feel like we have a good resolution to the bad guy, not just, oh, we're going to rip his heart out or, oh, we're going to come back three years later and burn down the town and hope all the vampires are gone or, or we're going to bully you move and be, be fine. Right, like <laughs> I just, I feel like to me, this 
this was a solid plan. Not just we survived the bad day, but this is Overlook Hotel worthy uh, of just blowing up the boy, like destruction. But, of... but I mean, I think that even was like an in the moment decision. This this was a plan. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. I see what you're going with. Right? Yeah. We it was sat yeah. down. We ran through a list Here's of what options. We, have to do. <laughs> we came up with the best. Okay. Oh, and, and then what if we did this? And what if we put it here? And then what if we did this? Okay. And then let's stink the whole island. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Solid plan. Yeah. Kind of covers okay. all the bases, I think. I'm good with it. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. What are we missing? Right. Did we get all the pictures? Yes. Did we get the. Okay, you got all the money from the houses. You got okay. Now I'll draw the picture that destroys the island because we might as well get all right, the cash. Now board. let's go do the Andy Dufresne thing and go start a hotel down in right. Mexico right. just because we can and we want to. So, yeah. right, totally fine. So, are we ready for some questions? Sure. Okay. I don't remember. Is it transition music? I I don't nope. think there is transition. Music. Okay. Question number two. Worked out. That was question one. Question number two. In what ways does Edgar remind you of other Stephen King characters that we have had before or not? Rich, creative type. We have a lot yeah. of those. A, hand, yeah. a handful of that. That's a, a bit of a trope, I, I'd say, in Stephen King stories. It's some guy who's creative and he's probably doing pretty well. Like, money doesn't really seem to be an issue on many of these stories for us. Okay. Yeah. Um, character per se wise, I I would put them. Let's see if we've gone through so many. Uh, <laughs> I'd almost put him in a Bill Denbro. Like he's a leader. He's definitely like, but you know, he's probably one of the better leaders we've had in a group of like the unsure leader kind of thing. We've had other leaders like the guy from Cell who was just this is what we're doing. I'm gonna go find my son. You can tag along and. It's just that's it. Uh, trying to run through all the other books that we've I mean, done. It's not really surprising that he's such a good leader, though. He literally created a construction company, yeah, over 15, 25 years that became quite successful. Like, you don't do that without having that's a that's a tough industry, let me tell you. Yeah, and, no, I'm uh, saying that him as a character, just in general, not right. just like a yeah, and I'm saying like it makes sense that yeah, he has that just inherently, not not a you're gonna do it my way because I'm saying so. It's I have reasons and I'll listen to you, but naturally I'm going to be doing this. Yeah. I would say like, for me, he reminds me most of the lead character whose name I do not remember in Salem's lot, who his, remember his wife had died in the accident and was just kind of like trying to regain sort of his life by moving to this small town to get himself out of where he had been. I know it's been a long time since we've read that book, but that's, and then he ends up like befriending the town, um, the older p- priest guy, right? That's Wyervin. And then there was the young kid. There's just, so I feel like there was similarities there, except in that case, that was a 30 something guy befriending like a 12 year old kid. And now we've got a 50 something guy befriending a 20 something kid. And so if, if you took that same group of people and aged them up and took them out of New England and threw them on a beach and it was yeah. vampires instead of sea witches. One other fairly one. Fairly similar. Yeah, one other one. I had to look up the name. Uh, Alan Pangborn. He, uh, again, that unsure leader kind of going through a loss, the loss of his wife and son and everything like that. Having to go through all. And then, yeah, you have this demonic creature invading your town, invading your life, and you have to take these steps to defeat it. There's the tropiness, like we said. You you see King uses the same methodology a lot, just in different cloaks, but they're good usually, so that's not a bad thing. Okay, question two. Really three goes back to the very first thing i said how appropriate very first thing very beginning how appropriate was pam's final reaction to edgar after ilsa's death in the moment understandable by if you take a step back and you're you're living in minneapolis 
you're kind of having these little interactions with your husband for the last six months, your ex-husband for the last six months, you made the choice. Then all of a sudden, you know, you're finding out about this weird stuff going on with them. And then, you know, everybody's happy to look at the show. Then that night you get a scary call from him saying, you know, get all my shit burned or get all, get all destroyed. And five hours later, your daughter's dead. In that moment, it's understandable. I'm not going to say, you know, it's right, but it's understandable. It makes you mad at her more. It makes you being like, oh, from our point of view, being all in Edgar's head. But if you take a step back, I can't blame her. I I can understand that visceral reaction to it. Appropriate? I don't think so. Does it make sense for her character? Absolutely. Uh, it's it's easy to be mad, and it's easy to shut things down. She's a very shut down person, is what I I, I noticed. Uh, she avidly doesn't want to talk to him when you know he calls her for a few different things over these months, and they're pretty basic things. And he does his best to keep his temper, and she instantly goes to. You know, I, I'm past this. I've moved on. Like, listen here. Like, come on. Like this, you still have a life together, regardless if you're married. You still have a life. You're still raising kids. Yeah, they're both college age. That doesn't go away. You don't stop being parents if you're not together. Let me tell you, if you don't stop being parents if you're not together. So, like, get off your fucking high horse, and realize he's going through this too. And I don't know. Like, I. I get I get the initial emotion of fury at, that she feels like he is completely responsible for this, but I don't know. I don't buy it. Bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, you don't think my answer is bullshit. Just her response. Hopefully, is bullshit. Like, I, your husband didn't kill your daughter. I mean, yes. Are there extenuating circumstances that lead back to his, some of his choices? Yes, but he didn't do it. And he did everything he could to try and protect all the people. And you don't give him any credit for any of that. And I understand, like, I get it. That is awful. I'm not saying you can't be all up in your feelings, but like, stop lashing out. Just be sad. Yeah. Anyway. She's a, she's I, a point the finger type. Like for sure. she, other than a, actual murderers and and like evil blood sucking clowns, she's one of my least favorite people at all. She's a Karen. Because she's my least favorite type of person. She is a very quick to anger, quick to defensive, quick quick to the, blame. Yep. It's never her fault. Yep. Mm. yep. Ownership and like empathy and like take a minute you can be sad and angry and upset without having to be yeah the, the account friend put it best up to 10 everything's up the, to 10 yeah. with her the, the accountant put it best she has great insight but no kindness and that's you know she's smart good, she's good very smart she's yep. you know yeah she's smart but she yeah no empathy no nothing the last question and it's not a fully formed question because it's just sort of rambling in my head but a lot of the story was based around brain science, particularly in terms of um, brain injuries or Alzheimer's or like adverse brain actions. How does that impact the story and or how do those relate to the shine as we know it? So pretty directly in this story, I'd say we have three prime characters that have traumatic experiences and brain injuries to some extent, and it opens up something within them, right? It elevates some of their skills and or it gives them premonition mind reading abilities. Those three are Wireman, Elizabeth, and our boy Edgar. Uh, Elizabeth and Edgar kind of show in the same way. Um, in the artistic, highly creative modes that basically allow him to sell paintings out of nowhere and her to create all these other paintings. Uh, and Wireman, he ends up getting like incre- like crazy empath and uh, 
mind reading abilities to some extent that seem to be heightened on Doom McKee. So I think it's kind of two things going on, right? There's the initial injury that opens up some door for them to access a shine like ability. Uh, and I think the the island itself is one of those hot button uh, pinpoints, magical places that amplify powers. And we know specifically Wireman once Edgar fixed his brain thing and fixed his blindness, he lost his shine completely. He couldn't he couldn't do his mind reading thing at all. Yeah. And I would almost say it plays into kind of the trope of where people say you only use 12 or 15% of your brain and there can be certain instances such as pre- traumatic brain injury that can open up deeper recesses that most humans can't access and it this may seem based off their personalities and such edgar and elizabeth like you said and even wireman it turns their insights up to 11 so in edgar's and yeah i had to make the joke uh but you know it turns up to 11 because it you know takes elizabeth and edgar's artistic abilities and puts it out there because we knew edgar did do drawings and sketches and stuff. He even wrote a book for Elsie or or for Lynn Not when like she was Simon. a baby. He likes to make drawings. <laughs> exactly. You know, we don't we don't know much about Elizabeth before her injury and everything. But then Wireman, he was a lawyer and he was a good lawyer. Most lawyers are uh good at reading people. They're very good at understanding and like having that empathy, having that in- insight into what is somebody telling me the truth and doing all that. And so I think that turned up to eleven on his realm of it. Like I said, once the bullet was taken out. It's just gone. And I think that plays into it as much. We could call it the shine. I'd almost say it was more of the cerebral uh, influx due to the brain injuries uh, over a shine magical element. Uh, I'd like to think of it that way. I'd like to think Stephen King's branching out. Just go with something a little different. Don't have to go back to the shine all the time. Just branch out. Call it a brain injury, and it just made their brain work differently. You know what? It happens, you know? You can be born mutant, or you can have things exposed to you to create mutant in you. Exactly. Okay. These are a few of my favorite things. (laughs) And I'm going to start. I never start. I don't like starting, but I have the right answer. Luke already told me. I I have the right answer. I agree. My favorite thing in this book are Wireman and Jack. I, I almost just said Wireman all by himself, but I think you add Jack in and it's like this, the three amigos thing they've got going on. I, I just, this book, I like Edgar. I think he's a great character. I don't think I would like him as much if I didn't get to see Wireman through his eyes. Yeah. Really couldn't agree more. That's yeah. So Any, anybody have a different answer for your favorite thing? I feel like if anything, honorable mentions. Yeah, I want to honorably mention uh, Elizabeth Eastlake. I thought she was an interesting character, like just the old woman on the beach, right? Just lived her whole life. The, the I tell you that is my dream life. The Godfather's just daughter, right? Like it's, yeah. I don't know, a, a, a very unique character. We've seen versions of many different characters that we saw in this. I don't think we've seen anything like her before. Uh, it was. She's she's pretty cool in my book, uh, for sure. The closest character wise to her, I would put, would be Dolores Claiborne. Oh yeah. Like a very just with it on there, you know. I mean, not with it because of the Alzheimer's, but in her time, a very with it and profound kind of different life. Yeah, absolutely. Like experiences. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely, but in that that just good solid elderly, you know, woman character. It, it perfectly written uh but since you guys got yeah the, the top two answers i'll just go with a, a great line to take away from this book uh i won't even make it my final thought uh seize the day and let the day do you or do i, the I, I day. do the day do the day and let the day do you sorry yeah uh and it, it's a great way to th- go about living it's just you know what you know live one day at a time keep going for and just have fun see where life takes you all right, will you do me a favor and let me share my screen? Sure. Okay. How do I do that? Click down to the bottom where it says share screen with a little arrow. I have to do that. 
Yeah, I made you post. Why'd you make me post? I was trying to make me share the oh, screen. Apparently, that was a terrible choice on my part. Well, that wants me to share my screen. I don't want to share my screen. There's no permission for me to give to you here. There is none. Well, yeah, it's not in share screen. Oh, God damn it. Now it's sharing my screen. You guys don't need to see that garbage. Oh. I mean, training you session. <laughs> you can't just hit the green button, Melissa, because I mean, I have green buttons as this. Uh huh. And it says host has disabled participant screen sharing. <laughs> Yeah, I already tried that. It's okay if you don't. I just can't show the. Um... I just made you a co-host. How about now? Hey, there we go. Bam. There we go. All right, all right. So oh, no. here, Hold here, on. here. Our video has disappeared. Up. Our video has completely disappeared. From yeah, the it, it went full. It, it forced it to go full screen. Oh uh, no! Escape. Okay. Just a scuffy, and it should bring it I back. Did. Not you. Oh, uh, come Luke. on. No, it does not like this. Oh. <laughs> it does not like green eggs and ham. All right. Here we go. Hold on, hold on, hold on. We're almost back. Hey, don't you guys just love new technology that gets thrust upon you last minute? All right. <laughs> you should be good to share screen now. There we go. There we go. All right. Sorry for our go. technical difficulties, everyone. And, and here we are. Okay, so here is our list of all of the books that we've read in our very randomly chosen order. Um, gentlemen, if you'll go to the workbook and put your cursor in the box and decide where you will place this book out of one through 16. Um, and then just give me a verbal yes when you are ready. Oh, I got to think about this one for just a second. I know. I should have. I, I planned to look at this ahead of time, but I was blitzing through the book by the last time. <laughs> Leading up to basically showtime. One time. last time. Oh. I know what I want to beat. So, all right. Okay, I think I know where I'll put this one. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Benji, you ready? I'm good. Okay, Luke. Yeah, I'm just about to type it in. All right. Uh, that's don't hit enter number. yet. Okay. Not yet. I am ready. Okay. Three, two, one, enter. Wow. Ooh, okay. I said five. Luke said 12. And Benji said five, giving it an average of seven, beating out it. Yeah. So it takes over it as number seven, and everything else will shift down. So I will go ahead and stop sharing and make sure I have that updated for next time. All right. All right. And then if you guys want to go ahead and jump in with final thoughts. Yeah, I'll, I'll start with mine. The reason I ranked mine um, up there, I wanted it to be Lisey's story. Uh, I, I wanted that one at the bottom. So I wanted that one as far down. So, and this one actually is a very good book. Uh, I really, I, I did not expect to get into this as quickly as I did. And I was invested up until the two thirds point. Anybody that wants to read it, uh, Linda, I know you were, said you were selling the fence. Give it a shot. If you can find a, uh, Free copy, maybe a library rental or anything. Give give it a shot. It, it's a fun read. It's a long read, so it's gonna take some time on it. But it's a entertaining, character driven story, and the ending does nothing to help the book, but it doesn't do anything to hurt it either. I can put it that way. the The main story is the character, and for the first time, I could say that's what I enjoyed most about the book. Melissa, you defend your number five uh, ranking there as well, since I'm oh, the I'm the I'm the on the opposite side of this. Yeah, I I guess like, and I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I didn't remember I've read this book before. This is one of the few this year that I have read in the past, and I don't remember liking it, but I didn't remember the story. And I think as as I gain more life experience and become old and older and older, but not as old as Elizabeth but older, I I can relate to those characters better than I could 15 years ago when I first read, well, like, I guess 13 years ago when it came out in 2008, but still, like, it has more to do with where I am in my life, and therefore I can put myself in there a little better, I guess, is what I'm noticing about the books that are sticking with me a little bit more. Um, 
I and and I liked that there were dead people again. I liked that there was like this crazy weird ghost killer thing. I to me, that's what I remember about Stephen King. And we haven't read a lot of those because we're doing weird pickups. We've missed a lot of his random killer creepy things. So I enjoy those. Would you recommend it? Absolutely. Um I think I don't know if this would be the first King I would pick up, but I would definitely put it up there maybe in the top 15. That 15 of that we've read. I mean, like of last, ever. your, your total King experience. Yeah. 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 So I ranked it fairly low on the list. I put it at 12 of our, what, like 14, 15, whatever it was, 16. Um, 16. And I don't know. It's, there's a lot there are a lot of interesting things uh, some really really great characters honestly i edgar is certainly one of my favorite char- characters wireman really one of my favorite characters we've ever seen in in any of these books they all felt real natural the relationships with his daughters his ex-wife it all felt naturally from his perspective and i thought that was that story was told well the magic stuff was interesting it probably could have been i don't know handled a little bit better in my opinion um the stuff at the very end yeah it it kind of felt eschewed in there a bit even though it was hinted at all this time it just to me it didn't set the hook as well as it should have i guess and it's eh, it was okay it felt disjointed to me at times um, it is a big part of why I ranked it a little bit lower than, and again, we're comparing it to some really great books too, right? And the way the list works out, you know, you almost compare it to where books that you love fall on the list. And it's like, well, is, do I think this is better than insomnia? I don't personally, I think insomnia was better than this. Is it better than something else that might be above insomnia? Maybe, you know, but that's where the the ranking system gets a little difficult, but overall, I would recommend way more a ton of books before this one. In my opinion, I I don't know if I would put this anywhere near any top of hey you should check this book out list. Definitely go for it if if you are just going all Stephen King, this one isn't going to be out of place. You're not going to be upset with it. I just wouldn't say it's amazing, if that is fair. Yeah, yep, completely fair. All right. So, all right. With that said, make sure you're following us on all the social medias that floats down here on Twitter and Instagram. Been kicking this one around. Make sure you send us your digital seashells that sound like bones under the house at, at floats down here at gmail.com. Uh, find us at the podcast that.com for all of our shows. Make sure you subscribe and rate us on iTunes and on YouTube under Drawbridge Media. This show and all of the shows we have at the podcast that.com are produced with the love and support of our wonderful Imaginary Legion patrons. You can learn more about our reward tiers at patreon.com slash stay imaginary. Join us next month for 11-22-63 when Stephen King takes on the assassination of JFK. You'll flow too. Stay imaginary. Thanks.